Okay, folks, I uh, see we still have people coming in. If you haven't signed, make sure you sign up front. Um, I'd like to get started. My name is Cheryl Davies. I teach psychology here. And I know most of you here, all right, uh, some of you uh, are from the human services class uh, or from the community. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to do a little brief introduction for our guest speaker today and then turn it over to Dr. Debbie Jofie uh, Ellis, okay? Dr. Debbie Jofie Ellis was born and raised in Melbourne, Australia. New York City has been her home days for the past few decades. She's a licensed psychologist. In Australia, licensed mental health counselor in New York, a presenter, a writer, and an adjunct professor at Columbia University in New York City, where she teaches rational emotive behavior therapy and comparative psychotherapy. For years, she's worked with her husband, the brilliant and renowned pioneer of modern cognitive therapies, Dr. Albert Ellis, giving public presentations and professional trainings in his approach to rational emotive behavior therapy as well as collaborating with him on writing and research projects until his death in 2007. Before his passing, he stated and wrote that he entrusted her to continue his work. She is recognized as a world-renowned expert on REBT and regularly presents throughout the USA and, and in countries around the world to students, academics, practitioners, and helping professions, and to members of the general public. She wrote the second edition of the book, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, published in 2019. And she wrote with her husband in its first edition. She's also featured in a DVD produced by the American Psychological Association, demonstrating and discussing the REBT approach. She has written chapters for various textbooks, articles, and has reviewed uh, publications for the ACA Psych Critics Journal. In 2014, she was named a uh, legend in counseling at the American Counseling Association Annual Conference and has received various awards and acknowledgments for her work. In 2023, she was nominated by former American Psychological Association President Dr. Frank Farley and renowned psychologist author Dr. Stanley Krittner to receive the American Psychological Association's International Division Global Citizen Award. She joyfully and passionately continues her mission of informing as many people as possible through her presentations, teachings, writing, and the way she strives to walk her talk that each one of us has the power to create our own, own uh, emotional destinies despite and including challenging circumstances and through teaching the how to the do. So without further ado, I'd like to present Dr. Jofi Ellis. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Cheryl or Dr. Cheryl Davies for inviting me and organizing my being with you on the big screen. And uh, hi, everyone at Southwestern Oregon Community College. It's really a pleasure to be with you all. Um, you know, I go to APA conferences and various other conferences, and it's my passion and mission to share the brilliance of rational emotive behavior therapy with not only professionals, as I do when I uh, go there, or students, which I'm doing now, uh, but I love presenting it to members of any profession or any level of education um, because rational emotive behavior therapy is not only the pioneering cognitive approach that heralded in the cognitive revolution in psychotherapy, but it's also a way of life for those of us who choose to apply it as such. And um, so my, my plan for the evening, unless Cheryl, you'd rather I do something differently, is to give you a, a quick kind of um, sharing of the basics of REBT. And then Cheryl sent me some excellent questions that I believe some of you sent in. And so I've got them right here and I'll go down and answer them. And hopefully after that, um, we'll have some time for you to ask me questions live if I'm not too scary. And if I am, then it's a great opportunity for you to overcome any shyness or fear. So again, Cheryl, thank you for inviting me. Even though Cheryl and I only cross paths at these conferences 
I'm sure many of you agree. Um, Cheryl has a, a warmth that radiates from her heart. She communicates with authenticity and care. And uh, even though our meeting Cheryl is occasional, it, it's, a, it's uplifting every time I see you. And I'm happy to be with you all. Okay, well, I know a lot about REBT, number one, because, and by the way, let me know if I'm talking too quickly, would you? I can see you all, so jump up and down or, or whatever and let me know, like, whatever, <laughs> or just shout it out. I'm, I'm intentionally speaking quickly because I, I know you want to be out of there in less than an hour, and so I want to share with you as much as I can. So am I talking too quickly right now? No, no, we're good. No. You're good. Okay, great. So, um, I when I was uh, studying psychology at the University of Melbourne in Australia, um, REBT was my favourite modality of all the modalities we learnt, and the reason was that it is the most holistic of all the approaches. It not only is no nonsense, scientific, evidence-based with techniques that are mightily effective, but it also invites us to reflect on our philosophy of life and living. What, what do I believe about my life and life in general? And one might say it's the, the pioneering contemporary mindfulness psychotherapy because it invites us to think about our thinking in order to empower ourselves to think in life enhancing ways and so you know it, it respects the mind body connection it reminds us that our thinking our behaving and our emotions are inseparably intertwined and essentially if we're doing the what comes first chicken or egg REBT leans into it's our thoughts. It's our thoughts. So the first main element, and I don't have time to go into the whole history of REBT, but I will say that my late husband, um, Albert Ellis, you probably know that I was married to the dude, right? Mm -hmm. um, he was a lot older than me. I was with him for the final um, 15 years of his life. We were friends through correspondence, I lived in Australia. We wrote letters then. Do you know, do you know what that, that stamps, you know, and you mail them? And, you know, and once a month, we'd make long distance phone calls on these, you, know, you, you dial. Anyway, I digress. So we were friends for a long time uh, before we, we were um, in a relationship and, and then married. And... Uh, truly soulmates in a profound way on many levels, even though there was a massive age difference. It, the only difference it made to our connection and our, our paths together was the fact that he died a, a lot sooner than I'm going to. And so I got all these years without him. But, um, but I carry his spirit and the wisdom and the brilliance of him continues. And so it's my joy to share it. And, and how I got to where I am now, I haven't forgotten. He created REBT and had a number of influences, which he gave credit to, including Stoic philosophers. And Epictetus was one of them. And what I'm going to share with you now, which is one of the main elements of REBT, if any of you have read Epictetus or Stoic philosophy, it will sound familiar. And my husband gave credit to Epictetus. It's not an event, it's not what happens that creates our emotions, but what we tell ourselves about them, our perception of them, that creates our emotion. So that reminder is, is not going to be accepted, digested, embraced by anyone who likes to blame other people or the world for their unhappiness. Okay, for REBT to really work for adults and teens, it requires the willingness to grow up <laughs> and take responsibility. But when we do that, how empowering it is. And one of the greatest tragedies, I think, in life is that too few people realise that it's not our circumstances. 
and that we have the power to control our emotional experience and destinies. How? By training ourselves to think in healthy, rational ways, because, and here's the next main element of REBT, when we think in rational ways about bad circumstances, tragic ones, um, something happens that, that is devastating or that we didn't want or we don't, you know, get something we wanted or something happens, a breakup, a death, you know. So when we think in rational ways about such events, then we create what's called in REBT, healthy negative emotions. In this context, negative does not mean bad. It just means they're not that pleasant, but they're healthy, they're enriching. They're part of the tapestry of life. And when we think in irrational ways about the same unfortunate or brutal circumstances, then we create what REBT calls the unhealthy negative emotions. What are they? The unhealthy negative emotions that we create, it's not our circumstance, okay? And of course, this only applies to people who are not cognitively impaired, who are able to think uh, about their thinking, who are not suffering from an extreme psychosis and who are grounded in a sense of reality, okay? But that's the same for any modality, pretty much, yeah? So when we um, think in irrational ways, the unhealthy negative emotions that we create include depression, despondency, hopelessness, anxiety, panic, extreme fear, rage, guilt, and shame. And when we think in rational ways about the same circumstances, instead of anxiety and panic and fear, we create healthy concern. You see, concern is motivating. Oh, my paper is due in a week. I better get up off my tush and, and either do research or make a plan for the next few days. Whereas anxiety and panic can lead some students to procrastinate. Oh, not now. I'm just not in the mood later. It's too hard for now, later. Or, or they find excuses and ask for extension after extension, put it off, put it off. Or they do a lousy job under pressure. Yeah. Um, not helpful. So concern can motivate us. REBT isn't about creating some namby-pamby, neutral, everything's okay, so, you know, it's okay, man, it's good. <laughs> no, it's about healthy, life-enhancing emotions. Um, when we think in irrational, so I'm, uh, sorry, I'm up to the rational, aren't I? When we think in rational ways, instead of hopelessness, depression, despondency, we create healthy sadness. Sad isn't bad. Dis uh, and, and disappointment and healthy grief. Now, sadness and disappointment, like concern, can motivate us to reflect, wow, you know, it didn't happen the way I wanted, or this is, is so sad, what's going on? Um, is there anything I can do to change it? The answer is no. Is there anything I can do to prevent something like this in the future? So uh, the sadness and, and, and um, disappointment can be constructive. Grief, you know, in the early stages hurts like hell. You know, we, we lose a, a person, a pet, an animal in our lives that we cherished or a stage in life that we enjoyed is, is over. You know, we, we um, have to move to a different city and we don't really want to, you know, and that chapter's done. Or for older people who used to, let's say, be really athletic and, and they might start getting arthritis and they can't do what they used to as well as they did and that chapter is over. And and so grief is, is simply married to our awareness or our recognition of the love and gratitude for that which we don't have anymore. Now, if we've lost a person or a pet, 
um, the grief hurts like hell. And in the early stages, an early is different for different people. For some, it's weeks. For some, it's months. But as time goes on, if there's not a change in the I don't want to get out of bed in the morning, it's probably depression and not grief. So um, going back to the health emotion, when we think in rational way instead of rage, which does more harm, no good, we experience what REBT calls healthy anger. We're in control. We don't react impulsively as often happens with rage and can lead to violence on various levels, whether physically or not physically, it can be emotionally, it can be verbally. Yeah? But healthy anger, REBT has this um, belief that if a human being is not disturbed in some way, there's a tendency to want to do no harm and to do good, and to have a moral compass. And so healthy anger would be connected to our moral compass when either we receive or witness brutal behaviour. It's that no that comes up, but we don't lash out. We are hopefully in the habit of thinking things through. What might the best thing be for me to do right now? to approach the person and talk in a calm way, to call 911, to run for the hills, to run around, you know, the block and let off steam before I figure out what to do. We think things through and don't react impulsively. And finally, instead of guilt and shame, when we think in rational ways, we create regret. Another emotion connected to our moral compass where we're willing to take responsibility that um, I might have acted really badly or I screwed up on that relationship or I procrastinated and so I got a C minus for my paper. And, and regret, we're not putting ourselves down as stupid, idiotic failures. We're regretting that, that our behaviour sucked. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't act in ways that really served us or our life, healthy life goals. And so we don't create shame or guilt, which means, you know, you're worthless, you're hopeless, you did something abhorrent, um, down, down, down. Regret is I take responsibility. I, I did a bad thing. I did a terrible thing or I was neglectful. But let me think about how to prevent doing this again. Let me see if I can make amends. Sometimes if it's to do with other people, we can apologize or talk. Sometimes it takes two to tango, they're not willing. Then our task is to accept what we can't change. We're fallible humans, sometimes we make mistakes. And if the other person is dead, obviously we can't literally make amends with them in their living form, but we can find peace within ourselves. It's really important to remember that unless science really dramatically uh, comes up with some new, new, new discoveries, and I think it's working on it, um, we're probably not going to live forever. <laughs> and so a lot of you are going to live many, many, many more decades. I mean, who, who knows? Things happen, but it's probabilistic, yes. And so here's the philosophical invitation from REBT. You have a choice. Are you going to create unnecessary misery or are you going to be your best friend? Are you going to empower yourself by training yourself to think in healthy ways till it's a habit. And by the way, it's not just me, 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 selfish, I'm going to, I'm going to. When we create healthy emotions, we become healthy models for other people. And part of a healthy human is a person who cares about and helps other people. I think that might be why a good number of you are motivated to study psychology it's, it's a, one of the professions we get a chance to do that. But you know what? Even if you weren't, caring for others doesn't require a profession. It just means you're near other humans and, and you have compassion and care. 
but equally so for oneself. So I hope I've clearly uh, distinguished between healthy and non-healthy negative emotions. And now my quick elevator version of what's irrational thinking that creates the unhealthy, what's rational thinking that creates the healthy. As I now first describe elements of irrational thinking, I invite you, please, with ruthless honesty, if you want to make the most of our little time together, to reflect on, do I, like you ask yourself, do, do you think in any of these ways? And is it helping or hurting? And see, with awareness comes choice. And if you recognise they're irrational and they're not helping you and they're actually bringing you down, then that's the first step to actually changing that habitual tendency. Okay, so when we think in irrational ways, we have demands, shoulds, musts, oughts, very inflexible thinking. By the way, if there are any questions or you want to discuss anything, because I can see you, if you can save it to the time we come together, it's a little distracting because I'm, I'm paying attention to you guys. Um, so there are some core irrational beliefs that a majority of humans, either through osmosis by growing up because people around them thought in those ways, they simply unthinkingly adopted them. Do you think in any of these ways? The first one, I, you ask yourself this, I must do well and be loved, liked, approved of by everyone. A lot of people who suffer from fear of rejection, you know, or, or shyness because they don't, they, they, they want the love and approval of everyone and so they don't want to say anything that would have anyone think badly of them or, or worse, yeah. That's paralyzing and limiting and common. So please, if you notice that you have that, and I notice some of you are acknowledging you do, great that you... It, and, and it causes such pain, such pain. Yeah. The second core irrational belief is you. So it's directed outwards. And you can be an individual or a small group or a family or a community or a religion or a non-religion or, or a political party or a country. Yeah. So you, individual or plural, must act the way I think you should, must believe what I believe, must treat me the way I think you should treat me. That belief is at the heart of war and terrorism, mm -hmm. a lack of acceptance of difference. A third one is life should, listen for the shoulds, should be fair and with justice to which I hear my husband's voice say, lots of luck. <laughs> of course, REBT encourages, it's humanistic. My husband fought vocally for civil, civil rights for all, no matter what colour, race or gender, back in the 1940s. And he was often called the devil because he spoke out like that. So, of course, REBT philosophy strives to make this world a, a healthier place with fairness and justice. But to say it should be when it's not at this moment that way will only create, well, either rage or hopelessness. That's not helpful. Another common irrational demand is the need for certainty. You know, in the early stages of COVID, where there was a rise, a reported rise in people suffering from anxiety, and it's like COVID's creating. It's not, it wasn't COVID. It was people's attitude to COVID and their discomfort with uncertainty. I must know when this is over. I must know if vaccines are safe. It's terrible. It's awful. I must, I must. And this allergy to uncertainty. A healthy human accepts that probably nothing in life is absolutely certain, even death, although there's high probability of that. And there are high probabilities of other things, 
that high prob probability doesn't equal certainty. Mm -hmm. And the demand for certainty coupled with perfectionism. I must absolutely know the right thing to do, the perfect way to be. Another, another uh, way we stick ourselves in the heart and cause emotional pain. Continuing quickly with the elements of irrational thinking, we catastrophize, awfulize. We think it's the worst that it could be. And though some things are incredibly bad, if we, each one of us, is still alive and not impaired drastically, then there is hope things can get better. Where there's life, there's hope, and that's not just a cliche. Again, if we're not impaired, or, or in pain 24-7, then we are impaired, actually. It's hard to think things through. Um, we have no sense of humour. We blow things out of perspective. We think in absolutistic way. We overgeneralise and we damn ourselves and others and life when things don't go the way we want. And we have LFT, low frustration tolerance. I must have what I want when I want it, little baby that I am. <laughs> then when we think in healthy, rational ways, it's the opposite of that. We have wants and wishes and desires, but not demands. Because if I want, 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 wish, wish, and I don't get it, I'll probably feel healthily disappointed, sad. I might grieve a bit, but I won't feel hopeless or enraged. Yeah. When we think in rational ways, we don't blow things out of proportion. We keep a sense of humour. We don't catastrophize, we don't awfulize, we don't think in absolutistic ways, we, we don't stereotype, we have high frustration tolerance. I love this mantra. I can stand what I don't like. I just don't like it. It's okay not to like it, but to, to not weaken ourselves by saying, I can't stand it, drama queen, drama king, whatever. We can stand, we're resilient. Humans are very resilient often more than we give ourselves credit for because we don't test it because we keep ourselves restricted in a prison of fear. And finally, when we think in rational ways, we have unconditional self-acceptance where we have convinced ourselves, and it's for some of us it takes a while to get there and to maintain, but we accept every human is fallible. I'm a fallible human, but I have worth simply because I exist. REBT asserts that humans, some humans may do very bad things. It doesn't make them a very bad person. It makes them a person doing very bad things. Where there's life, there's hope they can change. If a person does saintly good things, it doesn't make them a saint or a good person. It's a person who does a lot of good things. You know, semantics, the meaning of words, very important in REBT. And so unconditional self-acceptance is I unconditionally accept myself. I have worth. If I screw up, I'll try to do better next time, but I have worth because I exist. The second um, assertion in relation to that is unconditional other acceptance, where we are willing to unconditionally accept that other humans, like we do, are, are fallible, but they have worth because they exist. Well, some people have asked many times, how can you expect me to unconditionally accept someone who's, who's, who's raped me, who's murdered my family? Or whatever? How can you expect that? Unrealistic. Get clear. <laughs> REBT does not unconditionally accept that rotten behaviour and would encourage striving for justice where possible. But to do so not from hatred or rage, from a place of stability. And it's helpful to consider if we're willing, if we're not invested in keeping on hating, which, by the way, will shorten your life probably, our thinking and emotions affects our physical health. That's a whole other huge topic. Um, if any one of us, that's an evildoer, evildoer, if any one of us was born with their 
biology, with their endogenous genetic makeup. If any one of us had had their upbringing, been indoctrinated with whatever beliefs they have that might have fueled some of their rotten behavior, if any one of us had the insecurity and lack of self-acceptance and joined a group that said, if you do this, yay, or, or you'll go to heaven fast or whatever, if any one of us was thinking what that evil doer was thinking when they did the evil act, isn't it likely we would have done the same thing? It's not about putting them off the hook. It's about making a decision. We don't want to hate them. We hate the behaviour. Now, what are we going to do about correcting it if possible? That leads to forgiveness. And it's doable. There are enough humans, famous and, and unknowns, who have chosen to forgive. Um, I remember in North Carolina not that many years ago, a, a young, very disturbed, you know, disturbed people are the ones who do disturbed things. It's not healthy, stable people. And I'm not saying perfect because I don't think uh, what is a perfect person is no such animal, I believe. But one who tends to, to go the healthy way. And so this disturbed man joins a, a Bible group in South in North Carolina. I think it was North Carolina, maybe South. And he's accepted and welcomed. And at the end of it, he, he shoots. The, mo most of the people who were in the class, I think one or two survived by pretending they were dead under the table and the preacher they killed. And, and on the news that evening, relatives of some of the slain people said, we forgive him. He's a sick young man, you know, and it's doable if we want to do it. And you know, the Nelson Mandela's, the other people who have suffered injustice um, but are not embittered, it's possible. We have to want to do it and think accordingly. And finally, unconditional life acceptance, that we accept that in life, right now, there are some things that are unjust and cruel and shocking but we refuse to only focus on that, not suggesting head in the sand. It's important we be aware of what's happening in our world, that to give equal time for what still is good, equal time for what still is good. And if we're alive, if you're listening to me and comprehend what I'm saying, it means you can hear, you can think, probably you can see, even if you don't have all of your senses, you have some of them. And... If you look out the window, because you're not in prison, there's a beautiful sky. There's, no, I mean, there are so many things. If we don't choose to focus on the crappy ones that are good, and part of REBT encouragement is daily gratitude, whether you do it in a journal or just in your head when you wake up in the morning. I've nearly finished the main elements of REBT, and then I'm going to your questions. Um, and I'll really do my best to leave 10 minutes at the end for live discussion and questions, yeah? Um, with awareness, we have choice. So if we're not aware that our thinking creates our emotions, then we'll keep on doing what we've always done. So step one is being aware. Step two is motivating oneself to change. I do not have time to go into all the tools and techniques of REBT. I guess you have a textbook. One of the most popular ones is the ABCDE form of REBT. And if you don't have it, if you look at my website, Debbie Joffe Ellis, my three names put together, .com, there's a, a tab, self-care sheet, and it goes through the ABCDE. And heal or heal thyself, student, academic, heal thyself. You know, we can work on ourselves. And then it's a brilliant tool for those of you who are or will be therapists to share with your clients. It invites us, okay, what happens that seemed to create the unhealthy emotion? And you write the event, I, I failed my exam or my partner left me, whatever it might be. And then you go to the C, what was the consequence? And if it's one of those unhealthy ones, I told you, we continue. Now, if it's one of the healthy ones, I'm sad, I'm grieving, 
then we needn't carry on. The next step would be self-care and self-nurture because it's a healthy emotion under the circumstance. But if it's unhealthy, the next step is detective work. B, you identify as many rational beliefs as you can. Look for the shoulds, the musts, the overgeneralizing, the elements I've described. And then you do the D, which stands for disputing. You dispute the guts out of them by asking, where is the evidence that I should always blah, blah, blah? Where is it written? Is it helping me or hurting me to believe this? Can I really not stand it? Is it logical? We question our, our strong irrational beliefs. And as we do so, we come up with healthy new rational beliefs. No, I don't like it, but I can stand it or, or whatever the, the counterpart would be. And then repetition, repetition, repetition. Post-it notes all over the place. Put it on your phone, on, on the screen. And neuroplasticity has proven that it takes at least 30 days to create new neural pathways in the brain. And so if someone has a desire to create new habitual healthy thinking, it might take more than 30 days, but probably at least. Just repeat. It's not hard. You just do it. You know, is it hard to brush your teeth every day, which I hope you all do, maybe twice a day, I hope at least. <laughs> it's not hard, but you do it. And you know if you don't, the consequences will be bad. It probably won't kill you. Although long-term gum disease leads to heart disease, it might. But anyway, you get the picture, yeah? So with awareness comes choice. So there are techniques. There are cognitive. I just told you the main one. There are emotive. There are behavioral. Again, I, I don't have time to go into it now, but you get the picture. And then repetition, repetition. Um, one of the ways of reinforcing the work we do on ourselves is to share REBT with others. Now, not necessarily in a clinical session, with friends who are suffering, helping them see things in perspective and, oh, you're awfulizing this and come on, let's think things through. Um, so I think I've given you the main elements of REBT. So Cheryl, sh shall we open to the floor or do you want me to read some of the questions that you sent? Well, uh, I, I, why don't we open it to the floor and then uh, if we have some time, we can answer some of the questions you have. So um, this is a good time. If you do have some questions, David, and uh, you can speak of where she okay. yeah. um, well, Thank you very much for your remarks. Um, as just a brief comment before my question, I, I do think that much of what you said tonight is um, rather urgently relevant to events currently taking place on the Columbia campus and elsewhere. So I can That's leave it at that. I'm sorry? Do you know I teach there? I, 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 I just looked that up before you started, so I thought I would say that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, very, very, very relevant. Um, my question is, when you first started describing REBT, you, you rooted it philosophically in Stoicism. And um, I'm, I'm not that familiar personally with Stoicism, so I'm happy to take your word for it. But as I listened to your description, it, it seemed to me to be just almost suffused with what you might loosely call Buddhist psychology. Yeah, uh, these issues of it's not the thing that causes the suffering, but our reaction to the thing and yeah. uh, acceptance of impermanence in particular. And you also mentioned mindfulness at one point. So I was just curious if you could speak to the degree to which Buddhist principles might inherit in REBT and, and other similar treatment modalities. Wonderful question. Your name is David? Jacob. Sorry? Jacob. Oh, Jacob. Cheryl, A plus to Jacob. <laughs> you, you were the leader. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, indeed. Okay, so some of the other influence, my husband loved reading Eastern philosophies, contemporary philosophers of his day, which included um, Skinner and John Dewey. And uh, Alfred Adler, in part, was an influence. My husband was trained as a psychoanalyst, which... In those days, you had no choice. Freud was the lord of the psychotherapeutic universe. But, and my husband was good at it, but he found as he was practicing it, while some of his, um, we call them, I call them people I work with now, mainly people I work with or clients, 
In those days, they were patients. And he saw patients um, felt better after session, but they weren't getting better. Yeah, and they weren't taking responsibility for the creation of their own emotions. And being a master of efficiency, uh, he believed it wasn't necessary to spend years going over the past or free associating to make oneself emotionally healthy in the here and now. Anyway, um, he and John Kabat-Zinn were in correspondence. And if my husband had lived longer, they probably would have collaborated on a book. My husband and the Dalai Lama were um, very similar and corresponded a few times. And the Dalai Lama sent my husband um, a white silk blessed scarf for his 90th birthday. And my husband was due to meet him on a Sunday, but the Saturday night he nearly died, so we couldn't go, long story. <laughs> um, they both, and, and in... Um, The Art of Happiness, the Dalai Lama mentions the work of Albert Ellis and Tim Beck as being most similar to Tibetan Buddhism. Um, where there are differences is forms of Buddhism can speak in over generalities like strive for nirvana. Um, REBT is skeptical that a human can reach a perfect state or even if they do whatever that is to maintain it. So REBT is, is less overgeneralizing than some schools, but the Dalai Lama and Al, they were both very practical. Both of them said, had great senses of humor, loved to laugh, had to work on their tendencies to get annoyed easily. You know, they practiced what they preached on themselves. They hated the unethical behavior of others but didn't hate the others. So Dalai Lama hated what um, the, the, the policies of the Chinese government against Tibetans, but he didn't hate the Chinese. The end of my husband's life, certain people in his institute booted him out and did very brutal, unethical things. It was all over the, the, the newspapers and magazines because my husband was an icon, even to non-psychologists. He was just a New York figure. And um, he was quoted in the New York Times saying, I hate what they're doing, but I don't hate them. And I know that was the truth. And that's pure, unconditional other acceptance. You hate what they're doing, but you don't hate them. So anyway, I'm Jacob, I'm going a little around the mulberry bush. So yes, indeed, spot on. Um, and you'll enjoy Stoic philosophy. I re recommend you read it and those elements of Buddhism. I just, as I think of it, this isn't related to what you said, but a lot of people don't realize that REBT came 15 years before CBT. CBT, as time goes on, is more widely known, mainly because more insurance companies cover CBT practitioners, um, because they've done much more, to their credit, research, and that's not... That's largely because Tim Beck was with University of Pennsylvania. My husband only had a non-for-profit institute. Nonetheless, people were still doing research. But the good news is the CBT research supports the premises of REBT because guess what? CBT is based on REBT, has the same kind of scientific thrust, but less emphasis on exploring one's philosophy of life and unconditional acceptance elements, yeah? And um, my husband actually was a mentor to Tim Beck. REBT came out in the 19, early 1950s, CBT originally called CT, late 1960s, do the math. So it's not a competition and blah, blah, and my husband came first. It's just a, a historical fact that people aren't realizing. And I think it's respectfully important to know the, the shoulders on which others stand. So anyway, thanks for your question, Jacob. Anyone else? Yes, we do have, uh, would you mind speaking? Yes. Um, and, and the speaker, uh, Dr. Debbie Ellis can hear you right here. Okay, yeah. there. <laughs> I, I can't, oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> um, so um, I'm curious, um, is, uh, are there therapeutic 
scenarios, uh, situations uh, where REBT is not as effective as, uh, say, other modalities, um, or you know, maybe CDT is better, or one or what is better than the other. Um, do you know of any of those? Thank you. What's your name? My name is Sherry. Hi, Sherry. <laughs> nice to meet you. So, um, regarding people suffering from borderline personality disorder, REBT can be helpful. But for many of those people, DBT might be more efficient because it has a much more rigid structure than REBT. And, and it's like you do the homework in DBT, you commit to six or 12 months, and if you don't do it, you're out. So people who want to uh, adapt better to life, who have uh, BPD, may benefit more from DBT. Um, I don't see any advantages that CBT has that REBT doesn't. So when you ask about the comparison, um, and, and by the way, please don't misinterpret me. I'm not saying CBT, you know, you should only do REBT. It's what a, just have a rapport with your therapist and, and notice if, if you're, you're achieving your therapeutic goals is what I would say. But, um, and REBT for people who suffer from psychotic episodes or more extreme disturbances and psychoses, REBT is not anti-medication. But REBT would assert that for people who want to feel empowered and more whole, appropriate medication is just one wing of a bird that wants to fly. And it would allow the stability that then would enable a person to apply whatever, whether it's REBT, CBT, ACT, Adlerian, you know, whatever therapeutic approach that would hopefully help the person live in a way that helps them help themselves. Um, so for some conditions, medication is necessary to bring stability. Um, but apart from people with DBT, now REBT can be a very effective short-term therapy for people who are um, depressing themselves, anxious and so forth. For people wanting to overcome addiction, longer-term REBT can be helpful. I invite you to, if you don't know about SMART, S-M-A-R-T, recovery, to look it up. These, it's across the country. It's an alternative to Alcoholics Anonymous um, based on the work of Albert Ellis. And in fact, in Arizona, there's the Albert Ellis Smart Recovery Center. And so that's group, I think there's no charge for people just like AA. And, and some of the similarities is the support you get from other people and the encouragement and the acceptance. But in AA, it's more you, you give over to a higher power. And, and people who didn't, who were atheists, they kind of didn't buy that. And so smart recovery, it's fine for religious but non-religious people because it doesn't call for a higher power. It's inviting a person to empower themselves and support other people. Uh, REBT, very helpful um, with a, yeah, just addiction tendencies, uh, eating, sex, um, smoking, drugs, whatever. But again, that would be longer term uh, than for, for someone who, you know, I, I broke up with someone, I'm really depressed. And then the RBT can be very helpful in a, in a shorter time, but only if the person does the work. REBT is psychoeducational. It teach, it's not passive. It's not come in and talk and now oh, I've vented, I feel better. No, it's teaching the principles. Well, well, it wasn't your boyfriend, girlfriend, them friend leaving you that created your misery. What are you telling yourselves about it? And if it's irrational, which it probably is, dispute, dispute. And then the new healthy thinking that we repeat, repeat for at least a month. And it makes a huge difference. So can be short term, can be long term. 
Hopefully, Sherry, I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Woody. Yeah. You have to go, but you have to go in there. Yeah. And while so you find out, oh, a doggy. Hi. Does the dog have a question? Oh, oh, no, it's, uh, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Can, you it's okay. can you hear me? Oh, yeah. I, I can hear you. I can't see you, but if it's a problem to move, don't worry about it. Okay, fine. So, I, I can see the lovely lady who is next to you and the beautiful doggy. That's good. Um, I have a handsome dog too. So, <laughs> so my question: You, Columbia was raised. I'm just curious about your thoughts about how REBT techniques or thoughts or the process might help what's going on in Colombia and the rest of the country about the various conflicts that are going on. I know it's not quite a therapeutic question, but how those might those techniques help us move forward a little bit from where we are now? Great question. So there's there's a, a, a nauseating joke. How, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is just one, but the light bulb has to really want to change. And, and so to answer your question, yes, damn right, REBT could help people who are not invested in maintaining their fanaticism. Yeah. So REBT can change people who want to change. So how? Usually they need to be motivated. So if a person recognises, I'm waking up anxious, I'm waking up enraged, um, it's giving me asthma, it's giving me migraine, this is doing me no good, it's not helping my cause. <laughs> and they're willing to think things through and realise that their irrational demands are not helping their cause and hurting them. Then if they wanted to change... See, REBT, wouldn't, it wouldn't really be ethical to say, I don't agree with your philosophy, you have to change. But REBT might say, well, are you wanting this or are you demanding it? Are you demanding it? How's that helping you? Where's it getting you? And so, yes, if, if some of the students who are madly protesting are willing to contemplate how is this helping? Is there a better way of getting my point across? Am I damning the other person or some of their beliefs? So in, in conclusion, um, yes, because someone who wants to have a healthy inner climate and not harbour prejudice and the damnation of others, then the REBT philosophy of life and the tools for making that a habitual way of thinking are invaluable, but the person has to want to change. <laughs> I have another question here, and we have about seven minutes left. Yes, so all right. Go right ahead. Yep. By the way, what was the name of the man who asked the last question? Peter. Thank Peter. you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Hello. Hi. Hi uh, my name is Ryan Black. I just want to ask him: Has there been any sort of skepticism towards uh, or or EBT? I, I I know you said something about CPT being a more, more commonly accepted among the scientific community, and I know it's like there's been a lot of influence on Eastern philosophy and religion. Have there been any sort of pushback from the larger scientific community as a whole? And if so, could you elaborate on it? And if so, what? What? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Did you say your name is Ryan? Yeah, my name is Ryan Black. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for that question. Well, um, great question. They're, they've all been great. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when my husband was a, a student of psychology and graduated and practiced as a psychoanalyst, 
Freud was the lord of, of the psychotherapy universe. And when my, my husband started becoming more active directive with his clients, which psychoanalysis is not and so forth, and, and writing articles and, and starting to form his approach. And when he first presented it, Ryan, at the American Psychological Association Convention in Chicago in 1956, he was literally booed and, and made fun of. He was called simplistic. He was called stupid and literally had no support from any of his peers there. But he persisted. Fortunately, he practiced what he preached. And whilst he would have loved the approval of others, he didn't need it. <laughs> and he carried on. And over time, more and more thinking <laughs> um, people in the field came to see, hey, maybe there's something in this. So um, regarding skepticism, um, my opinion is because I, I I haven't read any recent survey on on who's skeptical about REBT, but my strong guess is that if a person is rigidly attached to my way is the only way, analyzing your past over decades is the only way for depth and understanding, then they would be skeptical that REBT can get to the root of things in a very short time. So yes, I bet there are a lot of skeptical people, but guess what? Sometimes, many times in my career, not only with my clients, and I do therapy as well as present and teach, but I, I've given longer workshops and when I do them, I. I've asked for a volunteer from the audience willing to bring up a real issue, not a role play. And by using REBT with them in a very short time, and, and often I hear, wow, I never thought about it like that. And sometimes a load has been lifted. And it's, some, it's a 20-minute demonstration. But a through REBT questioning and recognition of the thinking that's causing the distress and pre presenting the healthy thinking as an alternative, a person has become aware of things. I had a client who was in psychoanalysis for 15 years and twice attempted suicide and it wasn't helping her. And within weeks of REBT, I'm not giving myself credit, I'm giving REBT credit. Um, she was like, my whole life is different. I never thought about it like this. So I, I'm, I hope I'm expanding uh, uh, appropriately in relation to your question, Ryan. Yes, there have been skeptics. Yes, there are. REBT is, is Probably I'm biased, but so I am. But in my observation is the most holistic, humanistic, in-depth psychotherapy for those who are open and ready to receive and apply it that, that I've ever come across. It, it's brilliant and it gets to the heart and soul and spirit of people who are motivated to suffer less and enjoy life more. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Danielle. <laughs> thank you. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. Yes, and, and um, so I, I know some of you um, would probably like to go. Would you be able to stay just a few minutes longer? Is that okay, Deb? Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay. Um, Although I think your Zoom might run out, Cheryl. I'm seeing a timer in the corner. Oh, is it? Oh, so okay. let's keep talking. And if if you want to send me another link, I'll call in again. Or yeah. we can just keep going. Okay. I just want to make sure that uh, 
thank you all for coming. And if you do have one, you know, little question for um, Dr. Jenny Ellis, uh, please do stay. Otherwise, I will see you in class. Four uh, hours for today. Many of you. Yeah, it makes you think. I Well, if you're trying to get angry, it's me. I also okay. <laughs> uh, 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 She's like, yeah, something. Uh, 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 so I was like, uh, 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 Okay, um, thank you, Dad, for staying. Uh, I do want to encourage you guys if you have a question, make it brief and uh, let's see. Do you have a question at all? Go ahead. You talked about one of the keys is motivation or desire to, to change. Mm -hmm. And so, my question was when you have patients, what do you do to help bring out that motivation in them to change? Or when you have your people you work with that are said. Right, right. Thanks. What's your name? Uh, my name is Kelby. Kelby. Hi, Kelby. Yeah. So first of all, more often than not, when people come for therapy, there's a reason. And one of the first things in REBT that a, an effective therapist attempts to do is clarify the, the therapeutic goal. What brings you here? How can I help you? You know, and so, um, but a, an exception to that is people who are court mandated or their their family says you have to have therapy and, and they're just there because they're forced to be there in a sense. And so... Um, I, the first thing I, I try to establish is um, what do they want? And if they're like, oh, I don't know, I'm just here because my mum made me or whatever, I might say, well, listen, so you're here. How can we make the most of your time? So one of that's one of the things I'll do if someone seems resistant. Another thing that I might try is invite them to think about and tell me if, if you could change your life for the better, how would it be different? And sometimes what they present is, is very achievable, but it's going to require them to do some changing. And so the motivation would be my presenting, well, well, you know what, that could be possible, but it's going to take some effort. An Olympic runner has had to practice every day. He, he didn't, you know, graduate school and, and enter the Olympics, usually. So um, to have, to encourage them to have an image of how they want their life to be different in a better way, 
that can be a motivator. Um, and then again, as I said, if they're very resistant, just to say, listen, you're here. How are we going to make the most of this time? And maybe by giving them something that they want, they might want something of what you have to give. So if they want to just talk about how to be more disciplined with their workouts, and we could talk about that. But then that might take us to, I might say, well, you're telling me you want to be more disciplined, but you haven't been. So let's explore what do you tell yourself on those days where you just don't go to the gym? And that's an entry encouraging them to realise, hey, it's not anything other than my thinking that gives me the power to do or not do something. So, so anyway, I hope that helps. Thank you, Bobby. Can that help, Kelly? Okay, Jonathan, you have a question? Hi, hi. thank you for being here. Um, I know that you said to be aware to like, when you go, when you start the RBT therapy, you want to be aware. My question to you is this, is like, how can you recognize your rationality when you are in it? Um, that's an interesting question. Well, first of all, as I said, REBT is psychoeducational. So just like I shared with you, when you think in irrational ways, you have demands and shoulds and la, la, la. And so one would teach the client the difference between irrational thinking and look where it's getting you and rational thinking. And this is where it, it could help you. So there's that. And something I recommend to help people who want to become more aware or mindful is this that they put on their alarm on the phone or whatever three or four times a day, not when you're in the middle of class or at the gym or whatever, but a time where it's okay to get the alarm going. And in that moment, your task is, what am I feeling emotionally? What's the feeling like in my body? Is I uptight? Is it relaxed? And what am I thinking? The habit, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? And you do that three or four times a day. And after usually at least a month, one will just automatically tune in. What am I thinking? What am I feeling right now? And so that's a simple way to get into the habit of thinking about our thinking. And when we do that, we recognize, uh oh, I'm shooting on myself again. Hmm. Then we can dispute it and replace it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. It's it's so easy to do that. Bye, guys. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Actually, okay. Yes. No. Hi, uh, Doctor. I was so on. What's your name? My name's Lowell. What is Lowell. it? Lowell. Lowell. Hi, Lowell. Lowell. Oh, okay. So RABT seems like a good way to increase communication or the efficiency of communication between two parties. Um, my question is, how in a relationship, like even one between friends, do you, would you use REBT if one person had a stigma against like uh, therapeutic settings? Like, how do you do it without seeming like a therapist? Because I'm not qualified to do that, but I feel like this would be really beneficial, but I also know that some people are very uh, opposed to kind of that approach. Great question, Lol. Well, as I said earlier, REBT is not only a therapy, it's a way of life. And um, one of your fellow students, I forget his name, has recognized similarity with Buddhism and all. And so how you could do it, I mean, if you had a friend who um, who you really cared about, who was drinking too much alcohol, now if you really cared about it, you didn't. You don't need to be a therapist to say, you know, man, you, you're going to kill yourself. You, you're going to drive drunk. You, you know, and and how can I help you with this? Or, or 
you know, drink less or distract him. Let's go see a movie instead or something like that. If you saw a friend who's um, cutting themselves, you, you wouldn't ignore it and you wouldn't have to be a therapist. You could either say, hey, what's going on? You know, why are you so distracted? So to answer your question, don't think you need to be a therapist to help anyone. REBT, and I didn't say this, my husband was, one, was the first, arguably the first psychologist to encourage self-help books. So people didn't need to rely on a therapist. And so, Lowell, you can just be a good family member, a good friend and say, you know, the way you think you're making yourself pissed off and I don't like to be around you when you're like this. So when you calm down, can we, can we have a talk about it? And, and when you do, you could explore um, the fact that perhaps the person is demanding that you be different. Well, you could share, you've got the right to want me to be, but I don't have the right to change you. And so let's just talk and see if we can agree to disagree. So anyway, I hope you get my point. You don't have to be a therapist to, to help other people. Thank you, Deb. Okay, do we have one more question here? Ron, did you have a question at all? No? Katie? Eva? Okay. What was the AA thing? The smart. And smart. Smart recovery. And I, I, I didn't know that was started by Ella, so I really appreciate you doing that. I teach drugs and behavior, so oh. therapy, and I mentioned smart recovery, but I don't know much about it. Now I'm going to look into it, so I really appreciate you saying that. Yeah, great. And, you know, they have groups just for whoever. They have just smart recovery women's group, men's group. You know, so people can find their niche. There are a lot of virtual ones. Confidentiality is always a part of it, just like in AA. Yeah, it's a great thing, and it's based on REBT, yeah. Well, Debbie, I really, really appreciate you coming and talking with us today. It's oh, been fantastic. Oh, so good to, to be there. Thank you. And are you going to Seattle in August? Uh, no, I, I just went to the Western Psychological Association in San Francisco with students a couple of weeks ago. So I think, and I, I have to help my mother this summer just to get personal. My mother's getting a little older and I need to go help her. But um, yeah, so next time, I, you know what, I should tell you in the general psych class, we sing one of the songs you sang with us some years ago, um, done by Albert, um, uh, Yankee Doodle, to the tune of Yankee Doodle Dandy. So I do you love me, only me, or I will die without you. you love me, you or I will love me, go to, yes, yes. <laughs> I will hate your gut, dear, or something, yes. Yeah, that one. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, thank I, you. I, 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 what I will do is I will talk to students tomorrow and Thursday, too, and um, I'll tell you, I, I think they walked out really enjoying it, so I, I'd love to give you a little bit of feedback on that, too, as well. I would love that, yeah. Thanks again for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be with you. I love the questions. Uh, I love the, the vibe of your students. And uh, good to see you, Cheryl. Good to see you, too. Take care. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thanks, uh, those of you who stayed. Happy summer. Take good care. Huh? <laughs> yeah.